Hello everyone, this is Melissa Mari from Living Gold. This is uh, my podcast in bringing on people from all walks of life to share their life art journey and how they've used their life as the alchemical vessel of their own personal evolution and then a way of sharing that with the world. So today I am very fortunate to have Stephanie Mo Davis on and she I met also through Shadow Tech Alchemy. Um, that's our website where we study the shadow of ourselves and the culture and give tips about how to navigate that. But um, she showed up on our Zoom calls and she had an incredible story and what she's doing in her life um, going right into the system, into the matrix, into the medical matrix and trying to um, make it a better place. That's one of the things that she's doing. So I just wanted to, on her website, she has this beautiful quote and I just wanted to um, read it for you and then I will bring her in here. Fostering an enlightened future where the appreciation of knowledge and wisdom are understood and valued, calling all thinkers, feelers, and those embracing radical uncertainty bravely and honestly under one natural law. We are changing healing together. So thank you, Stephanie, so much for coming on to share your story. And I wanted to start out, um, so you had two kidney transplants, which is amazing. And, but I want to get this story before and then during and after um, how it all put it all together. So why don't you start? What was your childhood like? What? I love that that's your first question. Let's just get <laughs> right to the beef. What was your childhood like? First, I just want to say that I am honored to be here. And the work that you and Colin do on Shadow Tech Alchemy, finding you guys was a complete gift through a mutual friend, Scott. And I try to participate as much as possible because it is one of the very few spaces where I feel like I can show up in my entirety. And that's something that I, it's an ongoing process for me in the world that we deal with, with the matrix to constantly choose authenticity, even when it's uncomfortable. So thank you so much for the work that you guys do. Of um, course. Thank the, you. the transplant, we'll start a little bit of my childhood, as you said. Um, childhood for me, from the perspective I sit in now, because I have more emotional intelligence and awareness, was I recognize I was always an introvert. One of my earliest memories uh, about the, the stressors and what I was dealing with within the complex story of my mother and father who were 18 when they got married. Uh, one of my earliest memories was about age three. I was sleeping, it was the nighttime. I had these really cool Pac-Man sheets <laughs> and I felt sick to my stomach, which as a young child, I had a lot of stomach upset, which I realize now is mm. because I had an inability to process my feelings and emotions. But I had a lot of dealings with an upset stomach and one of my earliest conscious memories as a child of the act I was already putting on, I could see it, was I felt sick to my stomach like I was going to throw up one evening. But that day, my, I could tell that my mom was um, worried, right? I didn't have the language to say she's mm. stressed or overwhelmed, but I knew my mom had a hard day. So at three years old, I made the conscious decision in my mind saying, I feel like I'm going to throw up. I should call for my mother. But my mother was crying today. So I think what I should do is throw up in my own bed, pretend I didn't know it so she can sleep and we can deal with it in the morning. Mm. 
I mean, what a profound, like when I tell that story, the profound separation from my own need at such an early age to cater to my mom's crying and suffering. Do you remember it like that as a child or is this from going back and reliving it? This is a complete conscious, natural thought form that I had. It was very organic, very quick. I'm going to throw up, but mommy's been sad all day. So I'm mm-hmm. going to just throw up in the bed and pretend like, and I, I, I barely even spoke. So it just really proved to me at an early age that there was something behind me. There was mm. something behind, there was this observer, there was something in addition with my personality right. because it made itself known very, very quickly. Um, so I, I found ways to, um, I got really good at being alone Mm -hmm. and I I realized that I was an introvert. I, I had the attraction at young birthday parties to observe people having fun, but not participate in having fun. Hmm. I would sit back and I would watch and I would be so delighted in my heart, like a mature person to see others having fun. And I also could feel frustration if somebody was interfering in what looked to be a healthy, pure, good time. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not quite sure exactly what that is. You know, I'm sure it could be pathologized, but it was my way of finding a world that felt safe enough for me to maybe enter. So I had to really observe first and kind of get a lay of the land if I wanted to participate or not. What I've noticed um, in a lot of people who have these kind of journeys, very intense journeys in their life, is that they are running um, this archetype of the shaman or the outsider. Mm -hmm. And it seems like it just comes into certain people. It's not something that uh, you you want to have. It's just something that comes in. The fact that you had the awareness that you were watching, you know, you you had the watcher at a very young age. You were watching yourself and your life and things around you. So that Mm -hmm. all goes along with this archetype um the mystic the shaman so yeah so that's yeah it it was amazing i knew that i was different Mm -hmm. but at a at a young age there was a a longing to also belong but it was very difficult for me to find where i felt like i could be myself so again very early i felt well, I can hang out with the skaters if I just pretend like I'm the cool girl, or I could mm-hmm. hang out in this group if I pretended this. I didn't want to set pigeonhole myself into one group. I wanted to be a part of the jocks, the skaters, the druggies. Like I wanted to intermingle, mm-hmm. with, with, which I could, but I always had to kind of pretend that I was just solely in that group if I wanted to identify with that group, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does make sense. But so what, um, I know that you were, you became a yoga instructor a little bit later on, but Mm -hmm. what led you into that part of your life and was like, um, like, were you always interested in the healing arts or uh, what what did you want to do when you were like say a teenager or if you had those thoughts mm-hmm. um i again i experienced quite a bit of a stressful childhood between mm-hmm. uh my mother and father my mother and father split when i was five mm-hmm. and they both come from a, very extreme dichotomous backgrounds. So my mother's side, nine kids, partiers, druggies, mm. lots of prison, uh, Freemasonry in the family, like a kind of a lot of darkness and shadow. Mm. And then my dad's, my dad is a biblical scholar. Oh, so wow. I, so I used to have to get washed before I would enter into my dad's, like they would want to kind of clean me up if Mm. I was coming from my mom's to my dad's. So I I, I experienced this 
polarization of like darkness and light very early. But didn't your, I think you told us this once, um, that didn't your father cheat on your mother? Was that? Yeah. So that that's, again, that's what I started to realize as I started to become more conscious was there's these stories that both of these families are, are trying to proselytize, but actually they're, they're not living up to it on either side. Right. So that's when I really kind of was like, I have to find this middle space between mm -hmm. what's real in this family and what's real in this family, even though what they're showing to the world, it's not what they're saying that they actually are. Wow, that can be extremely confusing. I'm sure it was at the time. Yeah, I just kind of felt like I don't know who to side with. And again, in a world that's so kind of adversarial and wants us to pick sides, from the early age, I, I just didn't feel like I belonged even within the context of my own family, which led me to seeking. And when mm. I was in high school uh, and working at a restaurant, you know, I, I always danced. So mm. dancing was my art. So I started dancing. I was a ballerina at, at age four. Oh, wow. So okay. if, it, if it weren't for the dancing throughout my life to be able to express myself emotionally, which I, I entered into lyrical and modern as soon as I could because then I could be more free and less rigid to really just be spontaneous. So if I didn't have that structure of the dance and the freedom of the dance simultaneously, I don't know how I would have made it, but at um, 18, I was about to enter college and somebody had approached me and asked if I wanted to audition for a dance company uh, at a local university. Oh, wow. I, mm -hmm. I did, and it was something that I had never seen in my whole life because they were doing advanced asana or yoga posturing within the dance. Oh, so, wow. So it was so cool, and that's what led me into the the desire, the fascination, and the like, this is where I belong when I started to get into the yoga and do the yoga teacher training. Oh, wow. Okay. And mm -hmm. so how old were you when you started to do the yoga teacher training? 18. Oh, okay. Wow. So yes. then, um, so then, so how did the physical body, how did this the whole thing with your kidneys start happening what yeah so um it was odd and different i think and i love telling this part of my story because it's i think different what most people presume illness to be or how to manifest so i felt like i had found myself on the yoga mat i was mm -hmm. able to somaticize and feel i felt a sense of belonging i felt a sense of healthy health eating wise everything felt really aligned and that's ironically a couple years into that is when all of a sudden out of the blue i started to experience joint pain hmm. and i was about 21 at the time teaching yoga i had gotten a degree to, to do massage therapy really into the healing arts um really into helping and being of service naturally and all of a sudden I'm at my healthiest and i start to not feel well so this was very very confusing for me hmm. and i felt very betrayed by my mm -hmm. devotion to nature and to God. So I, I, I was very confused. I went through a period of I'm doing everything right, what is happening? And that led into a years long progression of joint pain turning into fatigue, turning into severe fevers and bouts of being hospitalized and being misdiagnosed. I was misdiagnosed four times. And I just was like, all of a sudden on the road to hell, like, ugh. No real reason why, but what I did to myself was I already had quite a bit of, of a controlling perfectionistic mentality from trying to survive within my family dynamic. Mm -hmm. So when my, my methods of health weren't working, I became even more extreme. And at some point I saw a doctor and he said, if you continue to refuse help from us, the Western, you're going to die because mm. you're doing everything perfectly and you are so obsessed with your health, but you're getting sicker and sicker and sicker. So I had to just surrender that for some reason along my journey, what feels so right needs something else. Yeah, that's how I've been feeling lately myself going through what I've been going through. But um, so what, looking back on it now, 
why do you think, do you have any sense of an intuition of why that started happening, of why it was that you needed to go through that? Um, sure. And to keep it kind of as simple as possible, for, like distilling it as much as possible and telling you how I feel now is it has contributed to a deep process of my own self-realization. It's helped me to understand profoundly that illness is an experience and it's not always a bad, it's not always pernicious, that there can be real beautiful things that come out of a, a physical illness. I was embarrassed when I first got sick because I was this wonderful yoga teacher studying Eastern philosophy and I felt ashamed that I was sick while I was a yoga teacher, like somehow I didn't get it right. So I had to overcome a lot of my ego. Right, right. Just saying I am doing everything right and I still got sick and I, I can't tell you why yet. So it really pushed me in a corner early to face my own BS. So yeah, basically it really was like a shamanic um, initiation then because you had to go through literal ego death. Here you are a beautiful young woman, you know, teaching yoga, bringing healing to people. You thought you're on your path. Weren't you in a relationship too at the time? Yeah, I was pretty new into a relationship and, and everything was great. And then all of a sudden I was headed out and it was, looking back, sometimes I don't realize how profound the, the, the mystery can be and how beautiful it is because I was 21 mm. facing my own death and laying on the floor. My whole body revolved, my whole life revolved around using, utilizing my physical right. body. Yes. And I was so debilitated that I was reduced to laying on the floor and visualizing my practice. I couldn't move. So I, I had no other, and I thought, well, who am I without my, my gift and my talent? Right. So I thought I have, I can do it somehow. So I would lay there and close my eyes and just visualize from start to end me doing it. And I'm telling you, it worked. Oh, you mean you would just do your practice in your, um, as like an act of imagination. Exactly. Cause I couldn't have the physical strength to do it at some point. And, it, and at one point I was in a wheelchair for a year. Mm. So I had to close my eyes and just use my active imagination and go through everything I'd want to do in real life in my mind. Hmm. Yeah. See, I've been, um, listening to a lot of Joe Dispenza a lot lately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that really is um, one of the master concepts of manifestation and of healing is this incredible intention and getting into a certain state. If you can get into a state of consciousness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with that intention and then you bring it into the heart. Mm -hmm that's how these things manifest. So you were doing that without knowing exactly what you were doing. So yes, that's, I did that's, not know. Yeah. Yeah. That's powerful. That's very shamanic. It's, it was also an act of maturing where I re I didn't realize anything about manifestation. I mean, I, there was no right. conscious attempt to change the situation. I just knew that I wasn't giving up and there's gotta be something I can do. So right. because of my yoga, I'm like, we're just going to visualize this. And then also I coupled that with re accepting at times. I remember very vividly a New Year's Eve and everybody was going out and I was just not feeling it. And I said, I have to stay in and I'll just watch from the window. And I was about 21, 22. Mm. And I sat there in complete utter peace, also realizing that I can't be there. I, I can't do what I want but I'm here and it's for a reason. And I have to say that that was mm. the driving motivation. I can think and look back and see very specifically that my ego didn't like where I was, but my, my, my big S self knew mm. it was for a reason. And if I ever would lose that, then I would feel depressed. 
But as long as I was like, this is, this is happening for some reason, I don't know yet. I just have to write it out, just write it out, just write it out. And if I kept that at the forefront of my mind, I was strong. But if I let it go and got too entangled in the lack of what I couldn't do instead of focusing on different ways of doing things, I would be, I would get overcome. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to ask you about that. So how old were you when you found out that you were going to have to have the first kidney transplant? Yeah. So I was about 24 years old and mm -hmm. the disease was progressing and I was, I was losing more function and they said, you need to get a biopsy. And I was utterly in resistance to it. I just, they were saying dialysis and transplant. And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> uh, this is not what, this is not what I know. And what's interesting, again, just to bring in the story aspect of this is I, seeing these, this big picture is when those words were spoken to me by my physician, I remembered vividly when I was in high school in about 10th grade, I was walking down the hallway to use the bathroom one day and I heard some counselors walking down the street or th down the hallway saying, oh, Joe's not coming back to school because he needs a heart transplant. And mm -hmm. I thought to myself in my mind, walking down the hallway out of the blue, like, oh man, I can't imagine what something like that's like. Mm. And then there I was a couple years later needing a transplant of my own. So I was getting messages the whole time. Mm. Yeah. So, so that was when you were 24. And mm -hmm. then how did that process um, develop yeah, so you? It, it, I had to deeply, deeply surrender to that, which I was resisting again, more ego right. death. And I had to go get the biopsy. I had to get all the drugs. I had to just do the hospital thing fully and disconnect. I actually had a provider say to me, which was very frustrating, none of your alternative natural stuff, yoga, like that's not going to help you now, girl. Like you better just put, put that in a box and we got to try to keep you alive. It got real desperate. I started hemorrhaging into my lungs, having brain swelling. All of my organs were getting involved pretty much one year of my life in the hospital, like months at a time, gloss my hair in a wheelchair. And I just thought, all right, here we go. I'm jumping in this river and I'm just letting go of myself completely. And I have to trust these people that I'm not sure that I trust. Wow. This is really hitting home for me right now because I'm going through exactly the same you know, the same thing at my point in life where, uh, uh, you've done everything that you possibly can do, you know, you're living a healthy life and your body is just not going along with the plan. And it's like, you know, but you want to live, right? Yeah. And yeah. You know, I'm a lot older than you were, obviously, you know, but I'm, I'm in going through that exactly right now. I, I want to live, yeah. you know, I still want to live. I still have so much that I'd like to do, but you, you have to completely surrender to whatever force, whether that's outside, it's outside and inside, isn't it? Yeah. It's like yes, you had to surrender that these doctors who you know a lot of them are just going along to get along and they're you know and they don't know anything about alternatives and and so that's frustrating and but then you know that if you don't surrender and realize that all is part of a bigger plan and you have to yeah. fully surrender and your ego and everything. Oh my goodness. That's yeah. such a grand experience. It's so challenging. I mean, how yeah. it's because I'm going through it I, and I'm almost to tears right now because I'm like right in the middle of it, mm -hmm. but it takes so much strength for you to have been able to do that. An incredible uh, amount of strength. What saved me was the realization that up to that point, 
I had really tried and I knew that to do the best I could. I had to accept, Stephanie, you have not been slacking. Now, you're going to work with a bunch of people who may or may not get it right. You got to let go and really give it to God. Like if you're going to live, this is going to be something that God does. And and, and it, that comforted me because I did have quite a bit of distrust in the system because of my misdiagnoses and mm. all of this stuff that had happened. So I realized at that moment in time that nobody takes my life except God. Right. And I really, really just was like, all right, like I'm just going to give myself over because this is in God's hands. I'm on board whenever I have to do anything. I'll be alert if somebody makes a mistake, but uh, God, I'm, I'm giving it over to you. What um, different people have different experiences of surrender, surrendering to a greater force. Mm. Is there any way that you can describe that process? in your own words? Uh, I can try. When I go back to that time and space, I didn't have any energy. I, I, I fought so hard, I couldn't resist anymore. Mm. So, I mean, I, I had to, I knew that I had to let go. There was no other way. And in that process, all I can say to you is, it was so clear to me, <clears throat> that my higher self, God, the great mystery was like right there with me. Mm. Like I never felt abandoned. So even like nights and nights in the hospital by myself, like just feeling crappy. Like I always, it's like a mustard seed. Like I just, I, it was always there. I never felt alone. I just, oh, I just beautiful. was just there the whole time. So, it, and I realized that power of me and it merging was greater than my fear, was greater than the doctors messing up or my fear. It was just greater than my fear. It was like Mm. this dual power that I just was like, all right, here we are. It was just there. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. That's incredible. I have to say that my ego, maybe because I am older, my ego has had a really difficult time surrendering through this. Do you have any insight on maybe why that is? Yeah, because my ego is incredibly stubborn that I had to develop an ego of survival because Mm. of traumas in my life. And so I had uh, I had parts that had to break off the internal family systems, mm-hmm. um, exiles. To, in order to survive, I had to um, have managers. Managers are the internal family system parts that manage the situation in order to survive. And so I developed these very strong managers to take care of me and a few other programs. Um, When things got really, really bad, I would have a running girl program that would Mm -hmm. run. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was, uh, well, actually that's called a firefighter because they're the ones that will show up to just put out the fire. Mm -hmm. This is all internal family systems, Richard Schwartz, Um, It's an incredible method as far as being able to take apart your psyche. And because these parts, they get stuck Mm -hmm. in like a, they stuck in a time loop, right? They're Mm -hmm. only operating from when they became activated and they're they're living parts Mm -hmm. in the organism. You could say they're neural, you know, neural structures, um, but they, they, they're organic. And mm-hmm. so in order to integrate and pull them back together, you have to be able to take all these parts and learn who they are and how they've operated and the, the voices that they use, the, the programs, the scripts. Mm-hmm. 
But in my case, getting back to this whole situation about surrender, which I think is so important because our ego, this ego structure, um, has a very hard time letting go. Yeah. And for people who have trauma, it and you develop these parts to to take care of you and protect you, then I think it becomes more difficult. And I, I think that's probably why I've had such a hard time surrendering and letting go mm -hmm. um, is because of this. I've mm -hmm. so um, yeah, that's amazing. Um, so you had the first transplant, and then how long until you got the second transplant? Yeah, so I, I was able to get my first transplant then after several years on dialysis, which was again talk about another layer of surrender. Get sitting in a room with a mostly diabetics or people that had lost limbs and every other day getting your blood filtered for four hours a day makes you feel completely dysregulated. You're, you're nutritionally, it just, that might've been one of the hardest experiences because there was, it's almost like there's no end in sight and you're hooked up to a machine to function. And it, it's such a dependency that it's like either you become complete victim to the dependency to survive or, or you go crazy. It's like it's crazy. Fortunately, I had the opportunity when it was time for me to get a transplant because there are some people who go on dialysis who don't have an option for a transplant mm -hmm. based off of their health situation. So it, it was about four years of dialysis in my late 20s, which mm. matured me very quick. Most of my best friends were in their 80s. They died sitting next to me. So um, that was very difficult. But fortunately, the glorification of the transplant, as the medical system would call it, this gift of life that they we glorify, which it is a gift of life, became available for me. Mm. So at age 30, after 10 years of, of suffering, uh, I got my first kidney transplant and it was so incredibly rapid how the turnaround in my health was, but it was almost as if the entropy of my body over the last 10 years and my mind and my spirit was still not up to speed with this new functioning organ. Mm. So when I got home, of course I was happy. Everybody was ecstatic. I was, you know, healing and but about six months after, I sat there at my kitchen table and I, I had a stark realization of, I got a new kidney and I'm supposed to be, you know, my doctor actually said to me, go live your life, kid, go mm. back there. I had no idea who I was, what time I was in. I didn't have any financial resources. All of my friends were either getting married or graduated college. I, right, right. I just had no idea where to start. And again, I didn't have the knowledge or support to understand what integration was or trauma healing or CPTSD. I didn't right. know anything about this. Mm -hmm. I just knew that, holy crap, I feel depressed. Why am I feeling like this wasn't worth it? You know, so I, I went, that's when I went on my next journey. I felt like the first 10 years was this physical, somatic, experiencing, mm. sensing journey. And then after the transplant, most people will say, it's done. You're all healthy now. That's when the real work started for me. Mm. Now, you got a second transplant. How long was that? After yeah. The yeah, so I had about 10 years of really good health. And I did have quite a few uh, urinary tract infections, which is very common for women with kidney transplant. And what happened was that caused some scarring on the kidney. And then I had a severe virus. Uh, and then lo and behold, they were showing some damage on that kidney. So it needed to be, I needed to get a second kidney transplant, which is not that uncommon um, because kidneys don't last forever. Um, so then I thought, all right, here I am. I got to do this again. That was the same kidney or a, a, the other kidney? 
The yeah, so the the first kidney lasted ten years. Oh, okay. So then at at forty, right、oh. during those ten yeah during those ten years, I had yoga studios. I was working a lot with the community.、Mm -hmm. um, but then I all of a sudden my kidney function was showing that all of a sudden I'm going to need another one. And I thought, oh, here we go. I got to do this again. Okay, so it was the same kidney. It was the one you had transplanted. You had to have a second transplant. Yeah. Yeah. So that、okay. transplanted kidney was having some problems. So I then、see. I had to get another one.、Uh, okay. So I didn't.、Uh, but the beauty of that was I related ignorantly, but I related to having a second child. I was like, okay, I got this. Like I've integrated my trauma. I, I have the mental experience, the psychological, the spiritual, the emotional, the physical. I'm going to do this now. I will say that my second experience was really different because my observer mode, my witness mode, was full on. I、mm -hmm. was much more of a mature, self-aware person.、Mm -hmm. I could advocate for myself, and I will say this: that during the timing of this, I was deeply. In love with the person,、mm. where we had a very beautiful, in aspects felt like a very complementary relationship.、Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that the year it took me to, from my kidney failure to going back on dialysis to getting that transplant, the entire time I felt no pain. Mm. I felt no physical discomfort at all, and I barely lost any energy. And I thought, "Wow, this is very interesting. I'm in full blown kidney failure, and I'm still functioning a lot better than people that I know are healthy. What's this about?"、Hmm. So my, I was starting to realize this kind of weird、uh, principle of like, you know, you're not the body; you're beyond the body. And I, I found a way to somehow. Go through something and get a, a lot of intense medication and procedures, and be like, not disassociating, but but recognize that I don't have to feel pain. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'd like to. Can you elaborate a little bit more on how you could, yeah, overcome the actual. Process of feeling pain. I asked this last week of Sarah too because this is another thing that that I've been going through with my situation、um, is the the pain situation. And yeah, so what did you learn? I learned that I had, in addition to the the normal. Dopamine and oxytocin that would maybe run through somebody's body when they're in states of deeply being in love. Ah, that、mm -hmm. that could have been it.、Mm -hmm. But I also had such a complete and utter faith, trust, confidence, excitement of what was coming after this. Like I just was so clear、mm. on seeing the after picture. That it just,、mm. just, I can't believe. I mean, even my doctors were like, "Are you? What are you doing here? Are you sick?" I'm like, "Ah,、oh, I'm getting a kidney transplant." And they're like, <laughs> "Right." <laughs> They right. know, but it made no sense. So I think it was the combination of the chemicals, of being in love, and the utter those beautiful feminine principles of complete faith, complete trust,、mm. complete、mm -hmm. confidence. Complete,、mm -hmm. like I'm gonna be okay no matter what. This is gonna be wonderful. Life is gonna be great. I didn't focus at all on this just minutia I had to get through. Just like okay, I do this, but like I was, my mind and body and spirit was somewhere else. Wow. Yeah. But it, but I wasn't disassociated.、Mm -hmm. I was fully no, I aware. No, I understand. Yeah. 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 This is this is great.、Um, someday you should write about all this. Because、yeah. I think it 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 makes for a really helpful, very very helpful for people to hear this from somebody who actually goes through it, and you can、um, replace kidney transplant with any kind of severe challenge in life. It doesn't have to be a kidney transplant, but 
all these um, mechanisms that naturally came online through this experience is something that we all we all are you know can learn and this absolutely it just seems like it's it's coming from the divine oh yeah this 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 way of self-healing and going through these these challenges in you know in life is divine it is and it's completely mm -hmm. divine yeah i i have to say that i i am continuing to refine this and, and to write about it. But part of my work now is the critical nature of like nocebo and like helping providers to understand the cascade that gets blocked when you try to identify your patient with a diagnosis. Because most people, the first time I went through it, I didn't have a lot of the mechanisms that were online the second time. So I Mm -hmm. fully surrendered into it, but I also, I didn't have the gift, the skill, the connection or the learning to be where I was the second time, which was I fully realized. And what was so interesting is I went in to get my transplant. I'm in complete organ failure. Mm. Like, your blood pressure's out of whack, you have very anemic, like I should have been feeling very physically sick, right? I was, I just thought to myself, oh my gosh, like if we could figure out this love thing, like how this works, this mm. connection, this this mm-hmm. this truth of the story behind this, you could go through this, you could go through anything and know mm. that you're gonna be okay with a, with a complete reduced amount of pain. And when they put the kidney in, I mean, I had major surgery. I was in the ICU about, as soon as I woke up, maybe 45 minutes later in the ICU with a huge, you know, surgical right. incision site. I sat up in the ICU. I crossed my legs like a yogi. I sat up with a straight spine and I said, I'm healed. I'm ready to go. That's and awesome. And they, they, they all looked at me like I was drugged up or insane. But I have to tell you that even the anesthesia at some point wasn't enough to keep me conscious. Like it, it wasn't keeping me down. Oh. I was completely aware. And I said, no, I'm really ready to go. I'm healed. And I was saying that I'm healed. Mm. And they were thinking, of course, you got your kidney transplant. You're healed. And I was like, no, I will never suffer in my illness or with an experience like this the same way again. I could feel something like God healed my soul. Something happened Mm. where I knew that from that point on, I was never going to experience the complications of my physical illness the same again. Even if Mm. I had another experience, it, God's got me. It's going to be completely different. Wow. This is, it's wonderful. It's just so wonderful to hear your story. So inspiring. And I know, I know other people will feel that way. I hope that many people, please subscribe and, and like this video and uh, share it because there's a lot of people who are suffering out there right now in so many different ways. And stories like this can really help people understand that this healing power is coming through every human being yeah and, oh yeah and oh, yeah. yeah and so this is it's just very yeah. it's very beautiful and i just really appreciate you sharing it but i wanted to get into what you're doing now and how after the second transplant how did that um merge into what you're doing now with your uh, it's awakeninghealthcare.com is one Mm -hmm. of the groups that you're working with Mm -hmm. where you're going right into the belly of the beast trying to change the medical system making it more empathetic and helping you know patients navigate this crazy matrix land and um so how did that all come about 
Yeah. So um, first, I, I just want to remind your audience that if I can do this going through kidney failure and a kidney transplant, some of the mental health challenges or some other things that we're going through absolutely can be done and can be dealt with this way. We can we can face it and and go through this and not feel that the pain the, the same way. So, um, but what had happened was after my transplant, uh, about a year later. I disconnected from that love that I was mm. putting too much of an emphasis on to get me through my process. Right. I went through another subtle depression before I realized the love, number one, first and foremost, is the connection to the field and conscious awareness and God. That yeah. it's not a person. Yes. Even though he, there was a, there was a deep connection of God between us, I had to then get another initiation of you can do this alone with nobody because it's your connection with God that does this, no being. It does. There's certain things that we learn in relationship that we can't learn alone and vice versa. Yeah. And um so yeah, I, I've I've learned um, a lot through being in relationship, but I see that being alone, and I've learned a lot alone too, mm -hmm. but it's like, I think we as humans, we need both to evolve, right? Yeah, yeah. And there are certain times in our lives that, uh, that we need to learn the lessons of being alone, and then there's times in our lives where the only way we can evolve is through the relationship, you know? Yeah, so, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So I started Awakening Healthcare um, because I had a profound epiphany as I went through my experience that mm -hmm. number one, there's a lot of people waking up. Like this was pre COVID when this happened. This was in right. 2017. But I thought, I've been on the awakening journey for quite a while, and I thought there's a lot of people waking up. Uh, I see the ways in which the medical system, to maybe no fault of their own, but is really withholding or, or damaging people from their potential. So yes, are they needed in certain respects and for certain treatments or acute medicine? Of course, right? I, I, I use them for kidney transplants. It's profound help in my life. Right. But I also realized these deeper layers of the subconscious and the psyche and words and communication and identifying with diagnosis that was actually keeping people more cycling in the pain. And then I'd see people who had transplants who that's all they talk about the rest of their life. And I'm like, right. oh my gosh, there was no ability to integrate and move, the, to understand this was just an experience, yes. not a story. Yes, this is what happens in, um, in the cancer indus industry. Mm -hmm. Um, also, um, that's why I couldn't even tell anybody about my, I, I wouldn't for, you know, I got diagnosed, if, uh, in the, at the end of the summer, but I didn't want to tell anybody because of that stigma because, yeah. and I'm sure it's the same in the organ community it's where the pe same. people get, they become identified with their diagnosis or their illness and yeah. that that in itself it's like is is taking you away from life yeah and this is something i realized that i was not going to be able to awaken the medical community or take on this system because i was right. going to die doing that but i was very i tried to get very clever and say all right how can we incorporate the feminine back into healthcare what show me god what do i got to do and then he he showed me that get a peer experiencer onto the team get somebody that's not trained under the system back in the system to at least provide a different story for mm, the patients mm -hmm. let them use their creative mind to create their own story and not become the illness. And one thing I want to say to you about the labeling and identifying is that right now in the culture that we live in, I feel like it's so adversarial and so dualistic that 
humanity doesn't know how to treat somebody who has a diagnosis but by making them a victim so it's like yeah. it, it's like i don't know where to put you so and in fact when i meet with my providers now i've discovered that if i go into the doctor's office with my knowledge and intelligence and my left brain and act like them like i'm their friend it's a different relationship then I go in and I pretend like I'm the patient. But if I go in acting like a patient with the cognitive intelligence, they don't know what to do with me because in their mind, you're either with us as a doctor or you're the hierarchical or the lower patient. Yeah, I've noticed that um, I was trying to, my last telecall um, with the doctor that I'm seeing right now, I tried to talk to her like a human being, like I knew she did um, triathlons and was mm -hmm. an athlete. And so I was trying to talk to her like a real human, human to human, woman to woman, and, you know, remarked how great that was. I thought that she was an athlete and all that. And it did warm her up a little bit. Yeah. It, you know, you it's know. interesting because that you said this, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who's a heart transplant recipient mm -hmm. and her and I had a very profound conversation today because we have a lot of experience with the transplant team. And she said, yeah, she said, you know, I figured out that I have to be the cool girl and I have to go in and I have to like try to find a way to connect with them for them to be in their heart with me. And I said, yeah, welcome to my world. I have to go in and pretend like, oh, how's your kid? Or like, right. I'm, I'm with you so I can get the care that I need. Yes. Otherwise, I'm treated as a victim and, and then they're in that hierarchical, patriarchal mindset, left brain. But the thing is, is Do you I don't think want it. it. Do you think it's um, a way to separate their emotional body to the situation of having to take care of so many people and how uh, to be a caregiver, you know, and then to feel empathy? It's like, um, do you think if the medical system forces these people to turn off their empathy in order to deal? Do you think that has something to do with it? I think that that was the running story, but I don't buy it. Okay. Because I believe that that's what they do do for several reasons to, to create a barrier for their to protection, so to speak. But I know people who have done the inner work, they continue to do the work and they're healers or physicians. Mm -hmm. And when they're fully in their heart, there is no lack of energetic empathy and connection to give to some it's you're, you're you're when you're honest and authentic and open and coming from the heart you don't get burnout mm, it's it's true. i'm helping you you're helping me i'm being honest i'm a doctor but i'm a patient too and you're a patient and you're a healer too it's this mutual exchange that never drains you but i think that that requires a completely different paradigm worldview for the provider to do a degree of work to be able to be humble enough to say i'm a patient and a doctor you're a patient and a self-healer and let's do this together i think mm. that requires a whole new paradigm. yeah it seems like the only way because it is such a matrix and such a system yeah. and then there is the whole parasit parasitic part of it you know um, like I just heard, um, that doctors get a certain percentage from chemotherapy that they give to people or something. I don't know. You know, I don't know for sure, mm -hmm. but I know well, there's a lot of stuff. Like there was just a interview on Joe Rogan with, uh, the guy who started this alternative health community called weight ways to well mm -hmm. and um and he was talking about the uh some of this stuff and um so there's so there's a sec just like our government you yeah. know you're well you're right it's a system that's corrupted by putting objects and commodification over it, it the, the the incentives are perverse and again i i think it's a conflict of interest that many doctors know but they don't speak about it like right. you don't talk about it 
because there there is something within them. They're split. Yes. And it's like, they're very split. It's like, I do actually care. Most doctors aren't complete yes. egoic narcissists. Yes. Some are, yeah. some are psychopaths, some aren't, but a lot aren't, but it's just how they've been trained, the environment and community they put themselves in. They, there are perverse incentives that, you know, I, I know so many nurses and, and doctors on Instagram who just talk about making more money. And those type of people shouldn't be in the healing field, I feel. Mm -hmm. You know, but 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 the, the system does structure it to where the incentives are perverse and the doctors, I think, probably are profoundly split where they want to care, but they can only care so much. And then I want more money because I need more vacations. I need a ranch because I need to escape from my pain over here. It's just the compartmentalization must be out of control. And, you know, I think that's why we're seeing more providers having to deal with their own health crises, realizing mm. they don't even trust their own colleagues and friends, realizing how screwed the system is. I think this is unfortunately what it's gonna take mm. to, to try to actually make a shift is that the providers and patients are gonna have to work together, which means that the providers are gonna have to have a direct experience of their own to be able to say, whoa, is this what my patients have been feeling? Right. The whole time. Like right. they talk about burnout in the system. And I thought, well, do you know, like I've been a patient burnout for years trying to navigate the toxicity within the system. Now you know how we feel. So what do you think? I mean, if you could do anything right now, um, what would you do in to to facilitate that kind of a, a change a deep change uh without you know being too grandiose i think that what i would love to do besides what i'm doing is implementing the patients into the team to have that reminder of of their calling in the heart is to promote some sort of course about self-awareness within mm -hmm. medical institutions and education so mm -hmm. they can the medical students can find a way to value the right brain and, and the qualities of wisdom compassion love justice truth healthy relating communication i find a lot of providers are very myopically excellent at one focus but their whole field of communication and awareness is just null to void I think we need to start with maybe the medical education and then for those providers who are seeking and they're having an awakening and they don't know what to do is to have maybe courses or people that are that are in this community of awakening healthcare to provide them a soft landing to just, you mm -hmm. know, we don't have the, all the answers, but here's a landing for you as you jump out here are some people who've been through this and can try to help to support you with whatever your next step is. Yeah, I think that's great. And you are, it does seem, cause I went on the website today and it seems like that is more of the intention and more of what it is that you're doing. Um, it seems like just because I know that I don't know nutrition wasn't even being taught in the medical schools. Now, I'm not sure maybe if that's changed at all, but um, it sure is in the culture, you know? All these these modalities of, of inner work and meditation mm -hmm. and yoga and um, heart-based and mind, you know, mind-body-based medicine mm -hmm. is all in the culture. Um, so it just seems like this is the next wave. And if you uh, continue, it seems like you're on the forefront of it. I, I mean, I'm, a, I'm attempting. Like you said, there's a lot of mechanisms out there. You, uh, and a lot of providers will participate in some of this more holistic work. But mm -hmm. again, the, I think the pernicious thing is the compartmentalization and the failure to recognize the interconnectedness of the whole and how right. to put the whole together, which, which requires them to face their own compartmentalization, which I think is really truly the disease of the modern healthcare system. Yeah, 
uh, I think I think so too. I mean, that's one of a multitude. But um, let me see. Maybe I'll, I'll one final question. Sure. So, if you, as a patient, um, have to go into the system. Uh, and you are someone that is on the alternative health side, or you, you're, you're more inquisitive and curious and into health, how would you tell that person to navigate through the system? I just did this yesterday i had it i had an example so i'll tell you what i did number one i've realized that if the if the healthcare providers aren't going to show up as their full self as you said you have to take time to connect with them somehow the responsibility is for the patient to not detach from their full self even if it's something that the provider might not be used to so i've made a commitment to show up as my full self. So what I do when I meet a new provider is I just say, I'm different. I, I have a lot of curiosity about my illness as my life experience. I'm very holistic. Um, I will listen to you. I will you know, do what's needed to, to do as long as it's filtering through me and I'm feeling good about it. I just make the provider know that I claim agency of my own experience and that I, I fully love you and respect you as my provider if you are going to work with me as equals. And if it is not a good resonant fit, I will just simply find someone else for both of us. Now, I saw a provider yesterday um, and it's been complicated with her several times. And I've decided after a long conversation yesterday for the first time ever, I had to say thank you so much for all of the work you've done with me, but I don't feel our communication style and resonance is conducive to my well being moving forward. Please suggest me another doctor. Oh, that's very strong and a lot of boundaries and strength. So that's yes. very helpful. Don't be afraid to say, our communication isn't my, st you, you can't, every doctor doesn't want to lose a patient because that's their ego. Oh, I'll, I'll, I won't mm. fire any patient. I'll do with everybody. But the patient has to be responsible to say, this is my healing journey and I need us to be an energetic match. Right, right. So if you're not, if you don't have a right provider, you got to show up and you just got to say, this is who I am. Let's see if we, if there's resonance between us. It's like the quantum physics thing. Let's right. see if there's resonance. Right. And if there's not resonance, there's no healing in non-resonance. Yes, yes, I agree. This has been wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Stephanie, for sharing your story um, with us. And please uh, look at the show notes um, and go to her websites. And she also is on social media and is always doing really great short videos that get right to the point. So watch those and follow her on social media and go to her websites and she also has blogs and so she's writing blogs constantly so um thank you so much stephanie uh blessings in your journey and for living you know your alchemical gold and um if you would like to support me doing more of these there's two things um you can send me more people um, so feel free to message me, um, give me links, uh, go to my Gmail, uh, marisongs at gmail.com and send me links of other people you think they can be from all walks of life. You know, I want to interview um, farmers, regenerative farming. I'm really interested in their stories. I'm interested in artists. I'm so anything like that, anybody. And, and it doesn't matter how many followers they have. That's not the point. There's so many people with wonderful stories out there. And then the other thing is you can donate. Um, I can't work right now. And that's why I decided to start this because I'm on this 
quote unquote cancer journey right now. And I'm right in the middle of about to starting treatment, uh, Western treatment, because what we talked about before the other stuff hasn't been working. So please, if you want to, you can donate to me on PayPal or buymeacoffee.com and, uh, which will help me because I'm not working, <laughs> which I love to do. I like to work. So anyway, thank you so much everyone for watching and thank you, Stephanie and everyone have a wonderful, um, day and week. All right. Bye now. See you next time.